Here's how to world build properly. First, add your kink. Second, add an esoteric, absolutely crazy magic system. And third, recreate your home country with double the power at its greatest extent. Eh, and maybe some characters and plot and whatever. Hi, I'm Jack from the YouTube channel Stoneworks. Today we're talking about world building, a vital aspect to fantasy authors, game masters like in Dungeons and Dragons, and giga chads who just want to flex their own creative muscles. I've been world building since I was like five with stuffed animals, but back then you would call it maladaptive daydreaming. But many people are just now approaching this hobby as they start on their creative pursuits. So here's my guide on how to start thinking about creating your own world building project, because believe me, creating an entire universe just out of your own imagination is a pretty big task. Make sure to like and subscribe because my entire channel is just world building and creative storytelling. Whatever you want out of this, I can assure you I've got something for you. Okay. So today, we're gonna go over five pretty simple things that will give you some good advice and tips about how to start your world building projects. One, the purposes of world building and how your world's structure will be different for each kind of audience. Two, world building using science versus mythology. Three, having a premise and a theme. Four, starting on your map. And five, the three rules of wise world building. To start off, let's talk purpose. There's three main reasons why most world builders create fantasy worlds. If you simply want to have an imaginary sandbox world for yourself, if you want to write a book or tell some story, and if you're a game master for an RPG like Dungeons and Dragons. With my experience in all three, I can tell you that each type of world building should work a bit differently. Sandbox world building is the easiest. You can literally do whatever you want to do because you are your own audience. Are you into fashion and physics? Cool, write about absolutely dripped out scientists at a super collider. You like war? Draw castles and guns. The only advice I can really give you is try to make your fetishes and power fantasies a bit subtle, because otherwise we can tell. <laughs> The father of modern world building, J.R.R. Tolkien, was at his heart a sandbox world builder, as he created Middle Earth in order to flesh out the constructed languages that he was making. I often find that sandbox world builders can create some really good works of art out of their worlds, but that's like a side project after they've been working on it for years. So, if you want more advice, history, and inspiration from the real world that can help you with your sandbox world building, that's the entire point of my channel. So again, bury and suffocate that subscribe button to death. World building for fantasy books and novels is the most narrow focused. Since you're telling a narrative that you have complete control over, you're creating the world as it interacts with the story, sets the scene for the background and culture, and until you get your Netflix cinematic universe, nothing really beyond that. Your job here is to make the most understandable, unique, and immersive world as possible. One that you don't need to spend a lot of time understanding, but that hints that there's a lot of depth and complexity beneath the surface. All while minimizing exposition and unnecessary details, because that can just confuse your reader and destroy your story's pacing. Think of it like a movie or a theater production. The crew that works on the set doesn't have to build a full usable western town just for the backdrop. They have to build the forward-facing facades to give the illusion that they're in a town. Same concept. My advice for storytelling world builders is that the world is not your story. For people writing fantasy books and stories, there's a common symptom where you as an author work so hard on your world, you flesh it out and you make it so deep and unique and awesome, and you spend so much time on it that you never really get to writing the story itself. This is called world builder's disease, and I've seen it happen a million times. The world isn't your story. The story should be the dynastic conflict, the friends we made along the way, and how your characters change as people. The story is not a three-page rambling about how this tribal culture's marriage system works and why they eat raw bugs at weddings. 
Don't go into that unless one of your characters is at this wedding, and if you do, keep it as a short flavor backdrop. A little bit goes a long way here. This is also why it's useful to have your fantasy main character be sucked into an unfamiliar world, where someone else can naturally explain the important world building, and the audience can learn with them. The world isn't your story. Next, tabletop RPG world building is complex. Because your players are really unpredictable, you don't know what they're going to do or where they're going to go. If you've ever been a dungeon master, you know how quickly they can ruin everything. So, as you write out a story for D&D, it's helpful to not write a linear progression of what happens, as if it's a book that you're just going to take the players through. It's helpful to write a bunch of pre-existing relationships and tools that your players and antagonists have at their disposal. This could be something as simple as, there's a big lever activated trap that the goblins have in their cave, and the goblins know about it, and during a fight they're gonna try and run over and use it. Or maybe the players notice it and they try to use it first, and suddenly the two are tussling over something in the environment. Or if it's something more plot complex, like the evil Lich King has 12 agents scattered across the country. If the players go into a town and they unexpectedly kill one of the agents, or someone random that you can say is one of the agents, well, maybe the Lich King is now forced to attack that town to maintain his control. Your world building is set up as if it's a bunch of strings that the players may or may not tug on, and they progress the story when they tug on a string and something happens as a consequence. In practice, this mostly means having some vague ideas about cool stuff that could happen in the future, and then frantically reworking them and tying them together as improv at the table or between sessions to create a good narrative. This creative work is not easy, but damn is it rewarding. On top of this, players will often go in random directions that you're not prepared for, so it's helpful to have some stock ideas for towns, characters, and encounters that you can pull out to keep things interesting for this session, before you have time to go and flesh out that part of the world. It's why tons of dungeon masters always have a list of random dwarf, elf, and human names on a piece of paper in front of them, so that you can maintain the illusion that you know what the fuck you're doing. Note though, it is always respectable to stop the players from veering a thousand miles off course, and you can just gently ask them to cooperate and return to the prepared region for storytelling. These are the three most common reasons that people are world building. Just try to identify where you are on this list and keep it in mind as we move forward, and try to hone your world so it's best built for your own purposes. Next, science versus mythology. So. There's an ongoing debate in the various online world building communities about how scientifically realistic a world should be, versus how mythical and narrative it should be. Are you going to spend four hours creating hyper-realistic plate tectonics with weather patterns and the rain shadow effect to see where you put your deserts? Or is that desert on your map there because 10,000 years ago a wizard cursed it to never harbor green life and the gods were fighting and I blessed the rains down in Africa? That kind of thing. I personally like to have a vague, low effort but well-informed scientific accuracy to my worlds, and then I go and screw it up using all kinds of cheat codes and mythology to make it look cool and feel good. Ultimately, besides what some anonymous internet nerds might tell you, the only thing that really matters is that you like your world and your map, and that it's understandable for any audience you want to engage with it. Next the premise and themes. Now we can actually dive into our world. The first thing we gotta do is come up with some vibes and a theme that we want to explore. This could just be a few words to set a tone, like barbarians that ride on giant war dogs and everyone wears thick furs. So if I'm writing a book in this setting and I have a question like, what is my protagonist gonna see on the road between cities? Having this theme helps suggest a few clear answers. It could be barbarian bandits, hunters, and fur trappers, the aftermath of a caravan that got mauled by a giant bear. It makes it so that we can expect and integrate a gritty, violent tone from the theme, and it disqualifies an infinite amount of possibilities that would arise from having any other kind of theme. That's why it's really useful. Another theme could be something like a high epic medieval fantasy where corruption and toxic human nature exposes everyone's most primal instincts. 
If I were a dungeon master, and my players were really into this theme, then what'll they find on the roads between cities? Maybe it's a big, stuck-up and obnoxious bureaucrat who had his wagon break down while he was delivering a message from the king. And so, now the party can choose to kill him and steal his papers, or beat him up and take his clothes and let him run off. Cue the plot f***ery. Having a strong theme is going to arm you with an aesthetic and a logic that makes it easier to create and combine later stuff, instead of trying to pull things from a nebulous cloud of infinite possibilities. Personally, my favorite kind of setting to work with is a world that has infrequent moments of high fantasy, meaning stuff with lots of magic, divine intervention, royalty, and all that. But on the local level, life is harsh and dirty and poor. And if you look too closely at any place in the world, you'll start to find terrifying spirits and violent cryptids. Did somebody say a werewolf peasant uprising? Next, let's talk about starting your map. Let me start you out with a brief warning. I love to world build a lot of stuff, but if I'm doing it for a Dungeons and Dragons game or I want to write a story, I think it's best to start off with one region of the world and leave the rest vague and undecided for later. I see tons and tons of people get world builders disease, like we talked about before, in the step of drawing an entire world map. It's like they want to carve the world into stone with its most detailed landscapes, biomes, and whatever, so that they can start out with a complete global system and not let anything fall out of place. But this misses one of the vital practical aspects of world building. Oftentimes, you discover what's cool and interesting about your world as you make it. You're not going to start off with all the cool ideas and concepts until you've been thinking about it for a long time and you have some specifics you're building off of. For example, I have a project about mouse civilizations, and I wanted these mice to have medieval fantasy technology, but I also wanted them to be able to use old human trash, like bottle caps and sewing needles, so that it gave a whimsical and folktale feeling to parts of the world. These are two things that exist in contrast. How are you going to have a mouse decked out in awesome plate armor, but is also using a hundred year old bottle cap as like a pot? So I discovered an idea and I decided, hey, what if these whimsical human artifacts are magical? So then I accommodated this change by adding two landfill mountains of garbage right off the edges of the map which creates a whole system of trade and power revolving around the mice mining out human garbage. I couldn't have had this flexibility if I created the whole world map and I said, okay, that's it, time to move on to the civilizations. I suggest that you embrace the fact that your world is going to have to be flexible and it will change over time. Start with a regional map, explore what's cool and interesting about your world, and expand your world to its neighboring regions and continents as needed. Now the map of your project is so important, where we layer landforms versus ocean, mountains and terrain, biomes, rivers, and human development, and then maybe some extra information layers like resources, cultures, etc. So let's lightning round a bunch of great tips, tricks, and cheat codes to make a good looking map for your world building project. 1. Continental landforms. Peninsulas coming off the same edge of a continent are often kind of parallel. 2. Peninsulas and big islands on the edge of your continent often make the shape of rings, or weird blobby circles. You see this from Alaska down to Indonesia, the Mediterranean, and the Caribbean. 3. Draw giant archipelagos like the islands form around some bendy lines. If you want it to be more complex like you see in Southeast Asia, make more of those lines and make them fold in on each other. Also, have it so the land next to an archipelago has peninsulas reaching out into it, so it's kind of hard to see where the mainland stops and the islands begin. And some massive archipelagos form when the land just splits apart, so draw a landmass and cut it up yourself. 4. Earth's continents are usually strung together by thin, stringy isthmuses or island chains. The world-building trend of having isolated blobs of island continents isn't realistic to Earth's formation, but if you want that, you do you. 5. Have a few areas where it looks like the land is literally splitting apart, or where the coastlines could fit together like puzzle pieces. 6. Make sure some coastlines are super jagged and some are much flatter. The polar regions should be super jagged if the world has had glaciers. The world's coastlines are variably jagged. 7. 
really big mountain ranges are usually near the edge of a landmass, or if they're in the middle of a continent, they create big regions or long belts of several mountain ranges, not just one simple line of mountains. 8. Smaller mountain ranges can be pretty much anywhere on your map. Add highlands and small mountains to your heart's content. 9. A small blobby region of mountains on your map can also be anywhere, and these small mountains are like very rugged, rocky hills. 10. Make sure to add other elevation stuff like plateaus, highlands, basins, and mountain valleys. People often forget these. 11. For biomes, rainforest always exists at the equator unless the land is mountainous. Around 60 degrees latitude also has temperate rainforests on the coasts, so add massive wet forests there too. 12. Deserts. Land at 30 degrees latitude is desert or has a desert nearby. Due to weird climate stuff on Earth, at mid-latitudes and temperate regions, a continent's eastern coastline is often pretty lush, and the western coastline is often more desert. That switches as you get to arctic latitudes, but up there is always colder and drier. Building off of that, one side of a mountain range is usually super dry, and one side is more lush. And the interior of big land masses is often way, way drier than the coasts. 13. Dry grasslands are often really big expanses in the middle of a continent, so count them kind of like semi-deserts. 14. Any other temperate land can be filled by mixes of forests, plains, or whatever fantasy biome you want to add. Swamps and marshes are usually pretty small and on the edges of oceans, lakes, or rivers. 15. Rivers 99% of the time do not split into two rivers as they flow downhill. Most of the time, rivers flow into each other. The exception is at their end point in deltas, and every once in a while you get a really big offshoot river. Also, don't have rivers go from one coastline to another. Have them start in high and especially wet places, and then flow down to an ocean or a sea. 16. Human cities pop up where there's a region with good agriculture, meaning it's pretty warm, it's on a river or land with good rain, it's got soil, and then later cities flourish by having a good water source being on a defensible hill, having a nearby natural resource, and having lots of farmland or trade routes around it. 17. There's several kinds of human polities or states, and usually on maps only the big states and empires have their borders defined. Tribes get individually or categorically labeled vaguely over where they exist. City-states are usually labeled individually or as a region like Greek city-states. A lot of small states tend to exist where strong leaders can pop up and manually control the immediate area. Or you could label a region as petty states. Then big states and empires expand out, and at their height they usually have borders on mountains, rivers, deserts, or they're limited by how far they can travel for a campaigning season. And these borders often have weird pockets that don't adhere to these geographical boundaries for other social or historical reasons on the ground. 18. Very importantly, scatter a bunch of super interesting landmarks around the map, like you're making a map of tourist destinations. And lastly, make your maps have a lot of diversity among different regions. Make it so some areas have great inland seas and islands for trade, big bustling cities for farming, others are sparse with nomadic pastoralists and dry grasslands and deserts, and other forests have hunter-gatherers. The interaction between different peoples over time is a huge interesting part of developing your world. And you don't get that very well if your map is homogenous and every culture has the same sized cities dotting all over the place. So. These are the basics of world building your map. I hope this is helpful, because I bet it's a big reason why a lot of you are watching this. And four, for our final discussion, we need to talk about the three rules of wise world building. These rules are all about immersion, where a story or setting sucks you into it and you feel like you're really there, which is super important for telling a story or playing a game. The three rules are like this. The first is the rule of cool, the second is the rule of consistency, and the third is the rule of uniqueness. The rule of cool. The cooler something is, the better and the harder it is to break immersion. Always remember that fantasy and world building exists as an escape into fantastical worlds that we can use to explore themes of the human experience, and part of that are moments of extreme emotions like awe, terror, danger, and wonder. So, if you can successfully suck people into how simply cool and emotionally impactful some scene, setting, or concept is, then the easier it is to keep them there, and the more fantastical stuff they'll let you get away with without breaking their suspension of disbelief. 
Truthfully, a lot of good world building starts by thinking of a cool idea, then adding it to the world, and then reverse engineering how you would reasonably get there using the pre-existing logic and premise of your world. And then this brings me to the rule of consistency. Your world should not pointlessly stray too far from its default tone and themes. Otherwise, you violate the audience's expectations and break immersion. If you set up a world, you're also setting up expectations for how it works and what kinds of things are tonally appropriate for it. So like, if I have a D&D campaign for my innocent nine-year-old's cousins and it's set up where they can talk to rabbits and they often make friends and they use the magic of friendship to convince the big bad evil guy to stop being evil, then it's not appropriate for me to have an angry mob break into the castle and absolutely with a f that leaves a corn dog <sighs> Similarly, your world should have some thematic through line of why things happen. Morality, cause and effect, cosmic justice, or a lack thereof. In J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth, a mythology of epics and heroes, and so he uses a general logic that the good guys will win. Good, wise, and moral people make good leaders, and evil people will be destroyed by good people because they deserve it. But then take a look at the world of Game of Thrones by George R.R. Martin. He puts in a logic that the guys who act most ambitiously, judiciously, and intellectually in a game of scheming power politics will come out on top. It's not about morals, it's about playing the brutal game of power and doing what's necessary to climb to the top. Obviously, neither of these concepts are bad, because they stay consistent with what we expect from their own worlds. So as you start to write out the stories and characters of your world, think about what you're really trying to explore here, and keep consistency with how the world treats people who act in certain ways. And lastly, the rule of uniqueness. Having unique and original ideas is good, but having derivative ideas is not bad unless they're out of place or the audience can tell where you got them, thus breaking immersion. If you take an idea from somewhere else, you have to change it to fit the stuff that we've already talked about in our world, the premise and the consistencies. Somebody can use the plot beats of a My Little Pony story in their grimdark ash punk world, but only after they do some heavy editing and reskinning. Otherwise, that's gonna be weird as f and kind of funny. <laughs> And on top of this, it's bad to leave an idea that you took from somewhere else unaltered enough that your audience recognizes where you got it from, because that'll just make the world builder look cheap and lazy. This even happens on maps where world builders just trace real land masses, and they forget that people generally recognize the shape of Ireland. Like, yeah, there's no immersion there if I can instantly recognize your island of green leprechauns and potato famine. Now, I do think you can get away with stealing from real-life history far easier and more respectably than from other media. Not properly following the rule of uniqueness can make you seem amateurish, and it breaks the immersion. And in the infinite art of world building, that's pretty bad, and I know you can do better. So, that's the basics of how to start world building. Hopefully now, you have a better idea of what most people engage with in this hobby, tailor your project to your usage and audience, and maximize your effort and make it as cool as humanly possible. I have zero doubt that in a decade, some of you guys watching this who may be inexperienced in the hobby, I will be reading one of your groundbreaking fantasy novels, or listening to one of your D&D podcasts. Good luck, world builders. Check out Game of Minds in the description, and I will see you later.